morning. Our scripture reading will be from uh, 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and we're going to 12 through 15 or 16. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and in conduct and love and in spirit, in the faith, in purity, till I come. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who will hear you. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. It's good to be able to worship with you. Welcome to any visitors, and it's glad to, uh, we're glad to have you this morning here worshiping with us as well. So I learned my lesson on Wednesday, and I'm not going to use Maggie for an analogy in this sermon, but I'm going to use myself instead. Whenever I graduated from college, real life hit me like a sack of bricks. Hit me like a sack of bricks. Everything from taxes, bills, figuring out how to save money and not spend it on dumb things and eating out, it all came all at once. Everything hits you as soon as you get out of school, whether it's high school or college, everything just all comes at once. There's no stopping, there's no slowing the flow of time, the onset of life. And it was so strange to me because for years, whenever I was in elementary school, whenever I was in middle school, high school, and through college, people would look at me, they would look at my classmates, and they would tell me, you are the future. You guys are the future of the nation, the future of the world. That's the common line that we would hear. We'd been told over and over again that the world was going to be ours for the taking, that it was going to be our oyster, so to speak. And yet, whenever the world finally became our oyster, when we finally went out into the real world, we kind of felt like we were out of our depth. It was surprising. It was something that we had been told was coming for years and years and years, and when it finally was there, when it finally hit, when we finally got into the real world, a lot of people, myself included, didn't really feel ready for it. This feeling lasted for a little while, this feeling of being stunned, of being confused about how the real world worked, it lasted for a while. Figuring out how to save, like I said, was difficult. Figuring out how to manage bills, how to manage the DMV, how to manage working, it was all a challenge. I felt as though I had been thrust into the world somewhat unprepared. But as time passed, I thought about this. I and many others have been told for so long that we were the future. And in many cases, we focused on that so much that we forgot that we were living in the present, too. We forgot that we were living in the here and now, that we were part of the present. We were so focused on doing big things in the future that we forgot that we had big things to do in the present. Some people understand that they can do things in the here and now better than others. Some people are better at being in the present, at focusing on what's here than others. Take a guy like this. His name is Mosiah Bridges, for example. At age nine, he decided that he was going to start selling bow ties. Eleven years later, Mosiah has sold over $700,000 worth of product. That might not be a drop in the bucket for a Fortune 500 company, but for a nine-year-old, that's a lot of money. For most people, that's a lot of money. He's a successful businessman at a very young age. He's a financial success and he's a prominent part of the business world at such a young age. There's another aspect of this. There's somebody like Malala Yousafzai. At a young age, she was shot and wounded by Taliban soldiers. Why? Because she was going to school. She was going to school in the Middle East and that was not a very popular thing to do in a lot of those countries. Since then, she's advocated for women's education, and she's spoken at multiple UN functions. She's a passionate uh, speaker on women's rights and on women's education in the Middle East. She's a prominent and important part of the political world, and that started at the young age of 11 when she began writing articles about this very topic. I also think about people like David. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we read some about David and some of the exploits of his youth. Starting in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 33. But Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine, speaking of Goliath, to fight him. For you are only a youth. Well, he has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and took a sheep from the flock, I went out after it and I attacked it, and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I grabbed it by its mane and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has defiled the armies of the living God." Scholars believe that David was a teenager when these events would have taken place. When he would have fought the bear, the lion, he was likely somewhere around 13 to 15 years old. Maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit younger even. I probably couldn't even fight a wild dog, much less a bear or a lion. That's insane to think about. And if you think about how small people were in that day, they were probably like four or five feet tall. I mean, they were not very tall. And he's fighting lions and bears. And then, in a few short verses, he would fight and kill Goliath at the age of around 18 to 20. That's insane. He was able to do that at such a young age. He was a young man, prominent and important in the religious world, fighting for the Lord as a youth. All three of these individuals worked in different spheres. They impacted different parts of the world, and yet they all have one thing in common. Even as youths, they didn't wait for the future. They acted in the present. Rather than waiting to become the future, they did great things as young people. They didn't need to wait until they were in their 30s, until they were in their 40s, until their 50s, their 60s, they, to do these big and important things. They did them as young people. They did what they could where they were. They weren't worried about being too young. They weren't worried about being too inexperienced. They just went out and they got to work. They didn't worry about being the future. They worried about being the present. In the church today, we often look at our children, we often look at our young people, and we consider them the future of the church. And that's right to do so. They are the future of the church. But they're also the present. They're here in the here and now. They are here, and they can be active and valuable members of the Lord's church today, not just tomorrow. Whenever we look at our children, whenever we look at our young people, sometimes we forget how valuable they can be to the here and now. Forget that they aren't just a part of uh, what's to come in the years ahead. We sometimes forget that they can do things today that we need help with. They can do things today that David or Malala or Mosiah do. They can do all of these great things in the modern day. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that our young people aren't important for the future. I'm not saying we shouldn't ever think of the future. I'm not saying we should never consider them as part of the future. But what I am saying is that we should also spend a good chunk of our time considering how we can help our young people be valuable members of the Lord's church in the present. And that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at another young person in Scripture that was able to accomplish great things. I want to look at the story of Esther. There are three lessons that we can learn from Esther's life and the things that she went through, the trials that she overcame, three things that we can learn from her in order to help train up our young people, in order to help train up our children so that they can be valuable members of the Lord's church in the present rather than in the future. The book of Esther centers around the young girl from whom the book is named. It centers around Esther, but it starts with the story of Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti was the wife of King Xerxes, the king of the Medes and the Persians, and she was a very, very prominent person by nature of that status. There was a time at the start of this story that King Xerxes decided that he was going to call together all of his generals and all of his officials for this gathering. This was pretty common for that day and age. People would come together. The king's officials would gather together for sometimes up to three months at a time, partying and strategizing on what their plan for the next year or so is going to be. And in this time, Xerxes decided that he was going to impress all of these officials and all of these generals by calling Vashti to come and do something for him. We aren't exactly sure what it is, but it seems like it's something untoward by her reaction. 
And much to Xerxes' chagrin, Vashti, she refuses. She says, no, I'm not going to go do that. I'm not going to do what you've asked me to do. And in what essentially amounts to a comical fit, Xerxes signs a royal decree demoting Vashti and then begins a search for a new queen. Here comes Esther. Eventually, after a beauty pageant that isn't, isn't a beauty pageant, after uh, a man who wants to destroy all of the Jewish people comes in, after Esther saves her people, we see this great story of this great woman. But it all begins with understanding who Esther is. Esther was likely around 12 to 14 years old whenever her story takes place. Whenever she was married to Xerxes, she was likely a young teenager. That's not something that I really think of, typically, whenever I hear this story. It's a story that I'm familiar with. It's a story that I've heard since I was a kid, but I never really thought about just how young she likely was. 12 to 14 was the typical age of marriage in that time and place for women. And yet, to us, it still seems kind of icky, for lack of a better term, that this responsibility of marriage and queenship had fallen on Esther. This responsibility to be one half of the nation, it must have been a difficult thing for her to bear. And yet we see time and time again that Esther manages this situation. Esther manages all of this better than we probably would. I know better than I would. And we have these three lessons that we can learn from how she does that, from how she handles herself, from how she handles what's going on around her. And one of the first things that we can take away, the first lesson that we can take away from Esther's story comes from her path to becoming queen. In Esther chapter 2, turn with me there, in Esther chapter 2, we get the story of this pageant that isn't really a pageant. We get this story of Esther doing something pretty amazing. In Esther chapter 2, starting in verse 12, we start to read of this story. It says, Before a young woman's turn came in to go see Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfume and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go there, and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shashkaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. Now when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai said, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. So in this story, Esther asks the opinion of the king's eunuch. And we get an introduction to what kind of person she is through this action. We know that throughout the book, she constantly seeks the opinion, the advice, the wisdom of Mordecai, who is essentially her cousin, but I call him her uncle. That's just how things worked in my family, so that's how I'm going to refer to him from here on out. But it's made clear that Mordecai is somewhat of a father figure to Esther throughout the book. And it's made clear that he's raised her to seek wisdom. It's made clear that he's raised her to seek out knowledge, to seek out advice from people who know better than her, who know more than her. And she exercises this knowledge, this wisdom that Mordecai has given to her. Her actions in this passage demonstrate that this is a lesson that Mordecai has taught her well. This passage demonstrates that Mordecai has taught her humility. And that's one of the first things that we need to teach our youth if we're going to have them be useful parts, valuable parts, working members of the church today. Rather than doing what Esther thought was right in her own mind, rather than doing what she thought was best, rather than going out and just doing whatever she wanted, she went and talked to the person who was going to know better than her. Who better to know what the king wanted than his servant? Who better to know what the king wanted than someone who would have been in his presence constantly? Who would have known better than him? And Esther goes to ask for his advice, to ask for his opinion. She recognized that he would know better than anyone what the king desired and would find favor in. And so she looked to him for wisdom. That's humility. This humility that Esther demonstrates in this passage is a quality that we should aspire to instill in ourselves, in our children, and in all of our young people. 
We need to teach them that it's okay. It's even valuable to ask questions. It says that Esther was valued. It says that she was recognized. She won the favor of everyone who saw her because she asked questions. Because she sought advice. Doing this kind of thing, using your humility to ask people questions, to ask for what you need, that is valuable. And we need to teach our young people that that is the case. That wisdom, wisdom that comes from our elders, is valuable. And to those who are older, to those who are in a position to be asked these questions, who are in a position to have knowledge and wisdom that our young people might not, we need to do something. We need to be mentors to these young people. We need to be mentors to the young in our congregation. Older men, you need to be a mentor to younger men. Give them advice. Give them wisdom. Help them whenever they are stumbling. Help them even when they're not stumbling because they're going to stumble in the next few steps. I guarantee it. They're young men. Older women, do the same to the younger women. Give them advice. Give them wisdom. Seek to help them in any way that you can. Give these things to our young people and show them what wisdom looks like. Show them what the fruits are that wisdom brings. Show them what knowledge can bring them. That will bring about humility in their life. That will help them to understand just how valuable the wisdom of their elders is. And that will give them the humility to seek it out. I have a mentor that I go to for just about everything. If I have something that I need to do, if I have a question, if I have a frustration, if I just don't really know what to do, he's the guy that I go to almost every single time. And the reason that I do that is because he's shown me time and time again that what he has to say has value. He's shown me that the wisdom that he has is meaningful. When I was younger and he would recommend that I do something, I'd try it. I'd try it, and I would find almost every single time what he would advise that I do was better than what I originally had thought of. What he would advise that I do would work out not only for my good, but for the good of those around me and for the good of my relationship with the Lord. This mentor was very helpful to me. When I was angry at someone, he might present a perspective that I hadn't considered that would soften my heart towards them. If I was frustrated or if I was upset, he would often show me the other side. He would often tell me to look at the bigger picture and help me to realize what was important. If I was wondering what I should do in a certain difficult situation, he would show me an angle that I hadn't considered yet and give me a way out or give me an answer. Through all of these things, he showed me time and time again that there is great reward in humbling myself and seeking wisdom and help from those who are older and wiser than I am. And so if we want our young people to be valuable members of the church, if we want them to be valuable members of the church today, then we need to teach them humility so that they can seek out wisdom, so that they can know that they can have help when they need it. It's important to note that I'm not the one who sought out help from my mentor. I wasn't the one who initially went to him and said that I wanted somebody to teach me, somebody to help me grow. He was the one that came to me. He recognized that I was young and stupid. He recognized that I was a young guy like he once was that would need a guiding hand. He was the one that asked me to come to meals so that he could get to know me, so that he could give me advice. He was the one that gave me his phone number so that I could call him, so that I could text him when I was having trouble. He was the one that mentored me. I didn't go and seek him out. I wasn't smart enough to do that yet. And so again, to our older men and to our older women, seek out these young Christian men and women. Seek them out. Mentor them. Teach them that it's okay to not have all the answers. It's okay to need to look to somebody else for knowledge and for understanding. How much more likely are our young people to be valuable members of the church if they know that they have you to rely on? If they know that they can ask you any question that they need to? If they know that you have wisdom that is going to help them get through any struggle, any trial that they're going through? You can be that to a young person. So I encourage you to be that and to help teach them the humility that is needed to seek after it. If we look in a couple chapters later, in Esther chapter 4, 
we begin to see the second trait that Esther demonstrates that we should try to instill in our young people. In Esther chapter 4, Haman has already started to devise his plot to wipe out the Jewish people. Mordecai recognizes the danger that this presents to the Jewish people, as almost anyone would when they found out about it. And he turns to Esther for help. And now, just as a side note, that's kind of funny because it kind of demonstrates exactly what we're aiming for here. Mordecai, this man who is older than Esther, who is somewhat of a mentor to her, is someone who Esther has turned time and time again to for wisdom. And now, this older man is turning to this younger woman for help. That's pretty interesting that this young woman is being helpful, is being a valuable member of the Lord's people at a young age, even for this older man. And while this is certainly because of their unique predicament with Esther being queen, it does drive home the idea that our young can be useful, can be helpful to even those who are older and wiser. And they can be a great resource to all of us. But getting back to Esther chapter 4, we begin to see uh, something of this story develop in verse 11. Esther is speaking to Mordecai after he has tried to get her to go and speak to King Xerxes about reversing this plan that Haman has enacted. And she says, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, that the king has but one law. That they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Mordecai asks Esther to go in front of the king and enact their plan to save the Jewish people. But Esther's terrified, and rightly so. I would be too. Mordecai is asking her to do something that would cost Esther her life if the king was having a bad day. Mordecai asked Esther to go in front of a king who is known to throw fits when people don't do exactly as he wants. He is asking her to go in front of this man and risk her life. Xerxes didn't hesitate to dismiss Vashti. What would he do if another wife defied him? Esther had every reason and every right to be scared to do what Mordecai had asked of her. And in Esther chapter 4, and verse 16, we see what she does with this fear. She says to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and all my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther was terrified. Again, she was putting her life into the hands of a childish king, one who is almost painted as a satirical figure in Esther over and over again for his foolishness and for his rashness. And yet she decides to go in front of him anyway putting everything on the line. We often think of this as fearlessness, but we just read in verse 11, this is not fearlessness. This is not a lack of fear. Instead, this is confidence in the face of fear. This is strength in the face of terror. But more importantly, this is boldness in the face of uncertainty. This is boldness. And boldness is what we should, ins- we should aspire to instill in our young people. We're called to boldness over and over again in Scripture. To give just a few examples, we see boldness talked about in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 28, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and there are plenty more. These all discuss the importance of boldness for the Christian. After all, without boldness, how can we hope to preach the gospel to complete strangers? Without boldness, how can we hope to encourage a brother or sister who has fallen, who might have hurt us, who might have hurt themselves, who might have hurt their relationship with the Lord, to come back to a right relationship with Him? Without boldness, how can we encourage one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with all confidence? How can we do those things without boldness? Boldness is a necessary and critical part of the Christian's attitude and worldview. We have to be bold in the face of danger, in the face of uncertainty, in the face of hate and spite. Because we have a God who is certain. We need to teach our young people to have confidence in the Lord. And we need to teach them the importance of the spread of the gospel if we're going to train them up to be bold. 
Esther didn't just come to this boldness on her own. She didn't just decide, you know what, he could kill me, but I'll go ahead and do it anyways. She didn't just come to that conclusion on her own. Mordecai does something for her. In verses 13 and 14, let's read those real quick. Verses 13 through 14. Do not think that just because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews may arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai reminds Esther of what's at stake. He tells her that maybe she's been put into this position so that she can do this, so that she can protect the Lord's people. He is encouraging her to do the right thing. He is an encourager. One who builds up. You think about what happens many times in many places. You think about the story of Joseph. Joseph was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused of sexual assault. He was thrown into prison for years, all so that God could save his people from drought and famine in the land of Egypt. What if the same thing is going on here? What if Esther has been through everything that she has been through? What if she has been placed into this position just to save her people? That's the question that Mordecai asks. He encourages her to think about what she has been given and what she can do with it. Mordecai wants her to do the right thing and to stand up to wickedness, even if it may cost her everything. Mordecai encourages Esther to be bold. So brothers and sisters, if we want to have young people that are present and future aids to the gospel call, we need to encourage them when they're afraid. We need to build them up. We need to remind them of why they're here, of what there is to accomplish in the church and with the people that are out there that are lost so that they can go out into the world with all boldness and with all confidence. There's one final lesson that we can learn about training up our youth in Esther. That's in chapter 8. In Esther chapter 8, Haman's plan has been revealed. He's already on his way out. And Esther makes a request of the king in verses 5 and verse 6. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it is the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, you notice how over and over again she's humbling herself, just as we talked about earlier. She says, Let it in order be written, overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamatha the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? In this passage, Esther demonstrates something critical. Compassion. And that's the last thing that we need to teach our young people is compassion. Esther's kinsmen were in danger throughout much of this story because of what Haman had done, because of this plan that he had devised. They were at risk of being almost entirely wiped out by a wicked and vengeful man. And yet Esther stepped in and saved the Jews. She saved her people. Not because it was going to bring her a great deal of wealth. Not because it was going to bring her fame and recognition. Not because it was going to make her seem like she was some kind of special person. That's not why she did any of this. She did it because she cared deeply for them. She gave everything, risked everything for her people because she could not bear to see disaster fall on them. She could not bear to see destruction fall on her family. And to Esther, the Jews were her people. The Jews were her family. But who is our family? Who are our people? Who, as a young man once asked Christ, is our neighbor? All men are those made in the image of God, just as we are. We have a special calling to take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're to show our young people compassion, we have to do that. We have to take care of our brothers and sisters here in the church. We have to teach our young people to be concerned with the fates of those around them, both physical and spiritual. Show concern for those sitting in the rows next to you and behind you and in front of you. Show concern for your brothers and sisters out in the world at large. If they stumble, pick them up. If they need money, give it to them. If they need food, cook them a meal. If they need shelter, give it to them. 
We need to set a good example for our young people so that they understand that compassion is a critical part of the Christian's life. So that love for your fellow man is a critical part of the Christian's life. Show them that we value our brothers and sisters in Christ. But just as importantly, show them that we value those who are outside of the church, who are not part of the Lord's family, who are living out in the world and are lost. Take care of their needs too. Bandage their wounds. Give them a hot meal. Give them a place to stay. Give them a job to work. But more critically, more importantly, evangelize to them. Give them the gospel. Show our young people through your evangelism that you care not just about people's physical bodies, but you care about their eternal souls. Don't evangelize quietly. Let your children, let our young people see it when you evangelize so that they know that you care about people's souls, that you care about people's spiritual life, that you care about their well-being and their relationship with God. Show our young people that so that they can understand what compassion and what love looks like, so that they can understand that they need to do that as well. We have an opportunity and a chance to lead by example to show compassion for our young people so that they can one day show compassion in turn. We want our young people to be productive members of the Lord's church in the future, but they're capable of doing great things today, just as Esther did. As a teenager, she saved her people from genocide, from near extinction. And while our young people today probably aren't ever going to have to go that far... (laughs) probably aren't ever going to have to do something that, of that magnitude, they're capable of doing amazing things all the same. They're capable of going out and spreading the gospel. They are capable of helping those who are in need of help. They are capable of doing amazing things in the Lord's church and in the world at large. But that requires older brothers and sisters to be mentors. That requires us to take care of those who are younger, to take care of those who we want to see become people like Esther, young people like Esther who are not afraid of their youth, but instead use it to do great things. We need to be humble, and we need to show humility to our young people so that they can be that. We need to encourage our young people to be bold so that they can do that. And we need to encourage our young people to be an example of love and compassion so that they can do that. If we show our young people all of these things, if we train them in these godly qualities, then brothers and sisters, I promise you, we will find ourselves not only looking at a strong future for the church, but we will find ourselves looking at a strong present. Esther teaches us a lot of lessons, gives us a lot of things that we can teach our young people. I hope that we'll do that. I hope that we will train our young people up to be strong members of the church today and tomorrow. If you can help with that, if you need help with that, if you need help with anything, We're here for you. If you have questions, you can come forward now as we stand and as we sing.